Hey folks, uh, welcome back to the penultimate session of Bring Your Own Bold 2023. Um, can't quite believe we're here still, but here we are. Um, nearly at the close now, but my name is Dave Corlett. Um, I'm the part of the team here at the Creative Agency Shaped by the folks behind this event. Um, and in terms of this session, I suppose for the most part, um, th this event's been a bit of an, uh, an outlier, really, as far as 2023 events go, because we haven't really talked too much about AI. Um, in fact, I'm sure most of you are either a little bit shocked, pretty much a little bit shocked that we're not mentioning AI every third word, like most events this year, um, to be honest. But, you know, joking aside, you know, all of the focus on AI is, uh, is entirely justified because, quite frankly, it's the biggest game changer in a generation. Um, but how is generative AI changing the design process? And what does this mean for the future of brand communications and experiences? And as part of Microsoft's design team, my guest today, Nanda Costa, sits right at the intersection of traditional 2D UX, three-dimensional and immersive experiences and generative AI technology. And um, as an avid follower of Nando's work for a long time, both AI and otherwise, I'm so, so delighted to be able to bring you uh, just a little glimpse into his personal AI journey and his perspective on artificial intelligence in the context of art and design. So Nando, welcome. How are you doing? Yeah, hey Dave, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, excited to be here. I'm doing well. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Well, listen. Um, first off, you know, obviously you've been a, a super early adopter of tools like Midjourney. Um, pretty much, I, I reckon you were pretty much the first name on the beta list. I reckon. Um, but also, you know, Microsoft and Dali have been, you know, deeply intertwined for a while now, uh, thanks to, to Microsoft's partnership with OpenAI. Um, so I suppose I just wanted to start by asking, um, how are you and your team at Microsoft using generative AI tools as part of your design process? Yeah, I think it will vary depending on, on, you know, how you work, the kinds of things that you do, right? Like, but I think what I've seen is people using for, for all kinds of things, right? Like, uh, first of all, the day to day is about, you know, writing text, writing presentations, you know, creating documents, essentially. Right. And and when it comes to writing things too, even writing code. Right. Uh, I, I have a lot of peers that are in engineers and they definitely use GitHub Copilot to write their code, to assist, to focus on the parts that matter to sort of like create that initial gesture. But then fill in the in-betweens with the assistance of GitHub Copilot. And I've, I've heard from them firsthand that's been transformative and giving them time back for some other things that are more important than, you know, writing, you know, uh, hundreds if not thousands of lines of code, maybe focusing on some things that are more critical. But I've seen actually um, even, even being more transformative is just kind of getting organized, right? So uh, we have Copilot inside of Microsoft Teams, for instance, or uh, helping me at, at, with some things around Outlook. Uh, so like summarizing my meetings, right? If I, if I miss a meeting, if I'm double booked, but I want to catch up on what happened, I want to be part of a conversation, finding, you know, uh, creating a summary, uh, not only of meetings, but also conversations inside of a, a channel, uh, finding content, catching up on everything that happened, uh, if I've been out of office on vacation or whatever it is, uh, it's and even more important nowadays as we're still working very much as a distributed team, right? Not just all local in the same office together, but of course across many uh, countries and states. And I happen to work re remotely; I work from home, and so so that that uh, idea of being connected digitally uh, and not having to manually catch up to everything, but actually having some assistance. Uh, I think has been immense. Um, now on the part that we're talking about, which is like creativity, you know, uh, on the visual side, like early ideation of some things like uh, aesthetics, uh, definitely on presentations, you know, like um, creating, you know, the pipeline for 3D, for instance, creating textures for 3D visuals, uh, definitely super useful. And of course, experimenting with sort of like the basic, like raw capabilities of generative AI and to just imagine where our products might go next, right? Like I think everyone across the globe is thinking through the lens of AI now. So it has definitely heavily influenced um, product making process. Uh, just AI is part of every conversation now. Yeah, absolutely. And so I know a lot of the examples that you mentioned there 
particularly on the design side, are kind of gearing towards that kind of zero to one process, you know, that kind of early, early ideas phase. Um, is that kind of at the moment, is that where you see it adds the most value for you guys? Or, or is it also adding value a little bit further down the line too? Yeah, I mean, I think we're all still pretty much fascinated with the idea that these tools can create content um, seemingly out of thin air, you know, like for a designer, the idea that can I can start with a blank canvas and then after a few words, I can pretty much have a nearly finished, you know, incredible image uh, is still pretty hard to fathom. But um, I have a feeling that like the novelty novelty is starting to wear off a bit. And I think it will be the integration between these capabilities that we're talking about with the tools that we already use and we're accustomed to using for creating everything else that is just requires pretty much more serious production and attention to detail. That's what's going to normalize, right, for all of us. And <laughs> excuse me, I love this quote from uh, Joe McCarthy that I learned recently. Um, and Joe McCarthy was, was the, the scientist that, that coined the term AI. And he says something along the lines of, as soon as it works, no one calls it AI anymore. AI is what computers can't do. Once they can, it's just software. And I think that's what's going to happen. You know, we're going to stop seeing those little sparkly icons. We're going to stop seeing the A, shiny AI icons here and there. Eventually, it will all just disseminate into tools. Um, what I think AI hasn't quite unlocked yet, and that's the part I'm most excited about, is the idea that experiences eventually, right, this, uh, design, product design, essentially these experiences will be composable, right? So if we snap back to where we were, you know, in the 90s, everything was just like static. It was just links. I click on hyperlink, I get to a website. There's more links and links and links and pages, right? Then we moved to social media. It was all about like live content and things were refresh. All these feeds were everywhere. Then we moved to kind of where we are today, which is uh, adaptive content. I create an app. It runs on iOS or, you know, on the web and other platforms. Um, but now I think where we're kind of peering to the horizon, we can kind of see, well, can't an app actually be one version for me and a different version for you and a third version from someone else? And it's the exact same experience. Uh, that's where I think uh, we're headed, and and yeah, I'm excited about what's to come. Yeah, me too. You know, and it's been talked about for a long time. Maybe not entirely in the context of AI, but definitely kind of more personalized experiences where I land on a website. You know, it's um, tailored to me. You land on the website; it's tailored to you. And um, taking that even further through apps and social experiences seems like the natural way to go. Um, and and there, I think we're really talking about um, like the back end side of things driving driving that. I just wondered, um, because I, you and I have had this conversation before, so I'm really, and, and it was a little while ago, so I'm really interested in your perspective now, but kind of what's your view on um, where we're headed in terms of kind of the front end of that? So AI powered design for kind of commercial use. I mean, we've seen glimpses of it, like um, yeah. CoCAD, um, Marvel opening titles, for example. Um, are we kind of close to an explosion of AI crafted content or are there still major copyright issues in your view that kind of um, are preventing that from happening? Yeah, the, the Marvel one is an interesting one. I was actually, um, I sat down, began watching that first episode and I'm a fan of uh, title sequences. So I'm watching the title sequence and within like two seconds, I'm like, this was made in the journey. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I was so curious, I was so, um, I was like kind of excited that like, oh, somebody went and experimented with this, right? I thought it was cool, but it was interesting seeing how much negative uh, feedback there was from fans. Uh, and, you know, as some of you, I hope like have seen the news, content creators of all kinds, illustrators, writers, photographers, I have expressed concerns about their work also being potentially, you know, part of training generative models, right? So. Uh, we've heard, you know, several litigation cases, talks about new laws, agreements, et cetera. Everyone was trying to figure out, right, like uh, what are the rules surrounding AI? So that is still a little bit murky. Uh, but I think like Adobe, for instance, right, like um, they've been approaching this from the right point of view. They are training their models on content they already own the rights to. Uh, everyone is sort of part of uh, the agreement, right? 
Um, and there is a benefit to those creators too, if if aspects of that you know eventually get get uh, you know used more and more and more, those those creators sort of see some benefit uh, at, at the end, financial benefit. Um, but I've started to you know I think they've also opened the door. Uh, to each of us create our own, you know, new generative uh, content based on our own work. So an in interesting example is seeing like the style picker that just came up in uh, Illustrator that you can use today, kind of lets you create, um, you know, new line work based on uh, your own vector graphics. So you can select, create based on this, right? Uh, and then also, I find it hard to believe that, you know, this this wave is going to be stopped, right? I think what's naturally going to happen is, you know, the, all this cumbersome process that we have today will get ironed out and slowly blend into our favorite tools. So today we download some dubious tool from like Hugging Face or chat with some bot in Discord, and in my case, like create something in Mid Journey, up res with Gigapixel, bring down, you know, to runway to create an animation with Gen 2, then up res again with Gigapixel video. Like this is super messy user experience. And it's something that digital artists are totally okay with it. We grew up with tools changing all the time, but uh, to scale to a wider, mar a wider market, it's gonna have to be embedded into tools that are used by tens, if not hundreds of millions of users, right? So, um, and lastly, I'll say that, you know, in terms of uh, volume, We'll probably start seeing more and more, you know, of the kind of mid funnel, you know, advertising uh, uh, kind of work, like the web banners, for instance, we'll see on websites. That stuff will probably start getting. It will be probably be the first wave of avalanche of content that we'll see because the volume is just massive there, and you know, AI can really help there in like shaving costs, but also like scaling globally. Uh, and, you know, but I think the cream of the crop of all the handcrafted campaigns are still going to be done 100% by, by people. Yeah, me too. You know, um, I, I te definitely agree with you. You know, we're in that kind of messy phase where, you know, it's a bit of a wild, wild west to a certain extent. Um, there are tools cropping up everywhere, regulation being a bit all over the place. But once it's ironed out, I totally agree with you. It's going to be spectacular. I mean, my first thought was, you know, in years in years to come, you know, here's a, is, is this going to be obsolete? You know, are we just going to be talking to everything, talking to our yeah. phones? And it, and it touched and it gets it perfectly right. You know, I was at a startup event a couple of weeks ago and uh, they were pitching a tool for tradesmen, you know, for, for, for plumbers, electricians, you know, rather than filling in lengthy forms, this tool basically allows them to basically talk through the form and it just kind of goes straight in. Um, and, you know, I think that's just going to become par for the course. Um, I just wanted to come back to, to a point, though, because I kind of want to get your personal viewpoint. Um, you know, we just talked about the, the copyright issues that are kind of preventing so much of this work, rightly so, by the way, you know, becoming mm -hmm. large scale. What's your personal view on that? Do you agree with the sentiment that this is the right thing to do? You know, basically, no AI generated art in, it, in its current form should be used for commercial use because of those copyright issues. Is that how you feel? I do. I do. I mean, it's tricky, right? Knowing, I honestly, I'm speaking from my, my own point of view. I haven't done enough research uh, to be transparent um, on, you know, exactly what those models are trained on. And I think the, the reality is that a lot of them are pretty, you know, pretty much like black boxes. We don't know what has, what they have been trained on. Like, I, I adore the quality that we get out of Midjourney, for instance. But it's interesting how if you insert the name of an artist, you get you know someone that's really well known. Uh, I'll, I'll put, for instance, um, I don't know, uh, James Jean right there. You know, uh, if you put James Jean uh, as a as a prompt and say create something like James Jean, it does create exactly like that. And so that I think it makes it pretty clear. <laughs> That it's been, you know, it's been leveraging his art, and I think that is not quite right. Now, is is James Jean suffering from that? I I would doubt. I think he's still pretty successful, um, but but it's still very um, murky. And I I I would agree that we need better rules for that. I think we need better um, uh, remuneration for for the the real creators behind it. Now. Uh, should it be at the cost of not having any AI whatsoever? 
no, I think we need to figure out uh, some some fair uh, balance in between there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it will come, you know, I think it will come. It has to really, you know, because as you said, you know, what, what you can do with tools like mid journey is almost too good not to be able to kind of resolve that situation. So yeah, fingers crossed, but I just wanted to move on a little bit because um, the, these, these uh, 30 minute sessions go so quickly, you know, we're really yeah. into it already. Um, I wanted to move on to something a bit more practical for our audience here. Um, you know, for creative professionals, the day job, is um there's not enough hours in the day as it is really um and i'm sure there are a lot of people out there who feel like they're not necessarily make feeling like they're making the most of the opportunities that the ai tools offer right now um you are an avid experimenter do you have any advice for those people um who maybe feel like they should be doing more but either don't have the time or don't know where to start i mean i feel that way too <laughs> i think everyone does unless that's all you do with your time i think everyone will feel that way but I would say maybe like just kind of buckle up and embrace the mess for now, at least, you know, things will keep changing all the time. These models will keep getting even more powerful, not just like year over year. Oh, I did some this year. I'll wait to 2024. No, I mean, the reality is that it will be month over month, you know, and that has been the reality for the last year plus. Um, so diving in sooner rather than later, you know, experimenting, getting the feel for it. Uh, in my view, is kind of all you need to do right now. And so for those really interested in committing even deeper to this, I would suggest like an experiment, right? Like try taking, you know, at least like one of your assignments and do it like 100% with the help of generative AI tools, right? So it could be as simple as I'm going to make my next PowerPoint presentation, for instance, or my next Instagram post uh, using these tools. See what it's like to have kind of that initial spark of an idea being heavily influenced by AI and see kind of, do you like that? Is it, is it, does it make you feel kind of icky or does it feel like, oh my God, no, I didn't think of that. That's a really cool angle. I, I've experimented both, uh, but for the most part, I feel really positive. Um, also see what it's like to write all your copy uh, with the help of ChatGPT. Like I've done that. It doesn't feel great. And sometimes no great ideas come out of it. And I, I build on that. And then lastly, like make all your visuals with the help of Dali or any other model. I think doing so is, you know, definitely is going to give you at least like a sharper point of view on where things are today and then where you think they're going to go next. And most importantly, you know, uh, how you want to leverage this kind of new wave to accelerate or improve your own work. So that's that's what I would suggest. Yeah, yeah. And the emojis were going off on that one. So absolutely resonated with people for sure um but that's really great advice i think dive in you know with both feet one assignment is a great shout because that just gives you a sense of right and and then that comes back to this point that we make time and time again when we talk about creativity is when you're restricted all of a sudden you know i can only use ai tools for this particular assignment then it forces you to get really creative with how you select those tools how you use those tools and, and yeah. obviously, you know honing the outcome as well so that's that's a really really good shout um and also, uh, moving into slightly negative territory, I suppose, um, what about folks within the creative industries? Um, you know, it could be freelancers, it could be copywriters, it could be creatives, designers who feel like their roles might be under threat, you know, as these tools get more proficient and advanced. Um, do you kind of hold that view or do you think just we'll all adapt and at the end of the day it'll just be another tool to kind of get to grips with? I mean, it's it's undeniable that in some cases, let's say copyright, right? Let's say back to the example I gave earlier of banner ads. Like, am I going to need a copywriter to write the copy for like 20 different languages for 20 different markets? Like, no, I'll probably use AI for that. Um, but do I go publish right there and then? No, you definitely need a, a writer, an experienced writer to then use those tools, right? To generate the copy and then challenge it and validate it and then make tweaks to it. Like, and, and so honestly, I don't think there's a need to be to totally fear and be and feel like you're getting left behind quite yet. I think that instead creators, designers, you know, being replaced by machines, I think what will happen first, you know, definitely is that designers that are more comfortable with AI and use AI all the time are going to be the ones that outpace those that are not adopting it, right? Uh, so it will save you tons of time, uh, whether you're a writer, designer, or, you know, whatever role you have, 
those tools would just like free up more time for other things, for learning, for making whatever, thinking, conversations. And so the truth is, as this tech gets more embedded into our tools, we'll just spend a lot less time on mundane creative tasks and the more time actually being creative on things that matter. So, Yeah, absolutely. I almost feel contractually obliged to say that uh, AI won't take your job. Somebody using AI will because uh, yeah, <laughs> that's where all of these conversations tend to go. And that's the phrase that always ends up getting thrown about. Right. But I, I suppose, you know, in a slightly, cynic, slightly cynical way, but for good reason, because I think what you say is, is exactly true. You know, I think, um, you know, we have to get to grips with these tools. At the end of the day, if you look at it bluntly, it is, it is another tool, you know, and we've gone through, as, as creatives have gone through, you know, obviously the internet revolution going from, you know, pen and paper to digital, um, and then obviously, you know, moving forward into the internet era, um, as tools got more advanced, Photoshop, all the, you know, all of those through to video software, and now all, all of a sudden this seismic shift in, into AI. Um, and and what I really wanted to kind of, I can't believe I'm saying this to end on, it's gone so quickly, um, is is obviously, um, you know, AI is, is really, really dear to your heart. I think it's, it's quite obvious given, you know, the extent of, of, of your output. Um, and you're really, really deep into your own AI design journey now, you know, having been, as I said, a super early adopter of mid-journey. Um, I just wondered, can you just give us a sense of, of how profoundly it's impacted your life as a designer and an artist as well? Well, this might be counterintuitive, but uh, I'll be honest. I think early on, I was definitely in love with it all. I felt like, you know, it was going to replace my day-to-day -to -day tools, um, you know, eventually. And, and it may. Um, but, you know, now that a year, a year and a half has passed, I feel kind of on the fence. I feel differently. Uh, sure, all these tools are going to keep changing. Uh, and, and I think for the better. Um, but I don't feel as content um, and satisfied and happy, um, honestly, when I create only with synthetic tools, only with AI, right? Uh, as I do when I create everything manually, right? It's from zero to one without the help of machines, right? Um, of course, with software, but not, not with AI necessarily as part of the process. And so I can compare it almost to like, you know, hearing a podcast uh, about a book, and getting the synthesis of that story versus actually reading the book and interpreting it all on my own, right? So, so this idea of like AI everywhere, this moment that we're in, has actually pushed me to take on more tactile, physical, you know, art making. I started um, earlier this uh, summer to take on ceramics, you know. So it, it's like the mo it's like the opposite of AI. It's like here's a chunk of clay. <laughs> Where are you gonna go from here? And, and I make a point of just having music around. I'm not listening to anything else. I'm not, you know, having zero, zero plan as to where it's going to end up. And if you're curious about the, the little silly experiments I've been making, there's this group I, I, I started on LinkedIn called Art and Clay. So I just yeah. check it out. Yeah, and yeah. And I can see it. But uh, doing this made me feel more balanced again, you know, as a designer, because I already spent all my time in front of a computer, you know, using Figma, using Cinema 4D, using other tools for presentation and conversation. And so the fact that I can, you know, that can take away some of that uh, feeling that everything I was doing was synthetic, really, it was positive. And I think you may, I may have said this before in our last conversation, but I believe that once this is all said and done, um, I think there'll be a kind of renewed investment and embracement and uh, embrace of uh, an appreciation for real human made stuff, right? I think Microsoft kind of got it right in the way that they framed this from the start, which is referring to these AI solutions as a co pilot, right? Because it's the moments where AI is just kind of truly the only one piloting that we kind of feel devalued as humans. So uh, I feel good about this strategy. I couldn't agree more. You know, I think this kind of rise of the machines, machines taking over mentality is um, is short sighted because and it actually doesn't give people the respect they deserve, I suppose, because people crave that human connection when it comes to art design. You know, if it's crafted by a machine, that's great. And that's an incredible testament to how far technologies come. But I don't think it, it removing that human connection entirely 
Um, and I, I can see the appeal of, of working with something like Clay, which is, you know, your, your brain does all the thinking. AI does none of the thinking because it can't. You know, you're moving away from that whole world. Um, and yet, I, I, yeah, being an avid follower of yours, I've, um, I follow art in Clay. And yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I've not been patronizing you, but you've come a long way, you know, because your last pieces are awesome. Uh, so, I'm, I mean, you're obviously putting the work in there, and rightly so. Um, we've kind of come to the end of, uh, of my questions for you, Nando. So thank you so, so much. And um, we've just got five minutes for some questions from the audience. Um, and the first one that I would love to throw your way is, do you feel people and companies are embracing AI quick enough, either from an assisting point of view or from a creative output perspective? What's the logical first step for my company to embrace it as a positive tool rather than a waste of time? What's the fear? Yeah, it's super interesting because I I just went to Adobe Max um, last week or the week after, before that. I can't remember anymore. <laughs> um, and and I had a chance to meet with a few creatives, right, that, that are in the LA area, uh, both independent and agencies. I've also been talking with the longtime collaborators and, and, and creative studios. And from what I gather, there is sort of like a split down the middle, right? Um, it's not necessarily about your discipline. Like you could argue, well, concept artists may feel threatened, right? Because I can describe a concept and came up with like 20 things before you even began like painting the, the backdrop or even got your pen ready. Um, but that's not totally true. Like a lot of concept artists are actually embracing uh, AI and some do feel threatened. The same thing goes for VFX artists. Um, you could say, well, no, I'm going to use my 20 year experience and I'm going to build this thing where like, no, I can like ask ChatGPT to describe this thing that I want to achieve in Houdini and get like every single, you know, uh, thing that uh, every step of the way or what how I'm going to get to the final uh, result. And, and so, I, I think companies are adopting as fast uh, as they can right now. It just happens to be where everyone, you know, might have uh, a different way of dealing with it and they haven't fully come around. Some people feel like it's still just a toy. Other people feel like it's ine inevitable and you will be uh, transformative whether, whether you want it or not. And so uh, I think it's it's fair enough to just sort of, create space for people to sort of like, uh, you know, come to terms with it in their own, uh, at their own pace. But I feel like everyone is really trying really hard to make sense of it all, to adapt and, um, and honestly, to start experimenting. The reality is, from what I hear too, many clients will actually block projects from having any AI whatsoever, because they don't know the legal ramifications of it. And so Everyone is still just experimenting, trying to understand, um, does this, is this going to change everything or not? Can I, ex you know, bring a, a little percent of it into a personal project? Like, it's all over the place from 100% to 0%. Um, but it's just that moment in time. Uh, there's too many question marks. So uh, using at least for your productivity, getting organized, <laughs> all of that, that seems, you know, uh, you know, not a problem at this stage, but all the creative stuff, all the visual and motion and sound, it's tricky, but super interesting nonetheless. It is, it is. And I was just wondering because it's, it's um, I, you know, it, I, I suppose every company is different, right? You know, some companies have that natural inclination to embrace new thinking and give their employees permission to do that. Others, like you say, are slightly reticent and, and quite risk averse. Um, so surely it's, it's partly kind of company by company, really, um, would you say? It is. I think. I think if you're running a really large business, right, uh, whether it's an enterprise side, building a product, building, you know, uh, offering a service, or if you are an agency and you happen to have, you know, tens of thousands of employees and lots and lots of customers at really large scale, it's at the center of every conversation. No, no matter what part of the business you may be working in, banking or in like health or you know tech like it doesn't matter ai is part of that conversation i think it comes down to those smaller you know boutique you know uh, the stuff that i'm personally attracted to like will a um, studio that's focused on typography 
trying to create new fonts with the help of AI? I don't know. I don't think so. I think that's not quite there yet, right? But everyone is, might be experimenting with it, seeing how terrible it is or how good it is in some cases. And that's that's the part I find it really exciting. It reminds me back of like early days of the web where the web was sort of like fertile ground for creativity. Like, And Flash really was that kind of, you know, that really exciting new tool. Uh, this is very different, very much bigger scale, but it gives me flashbacks to that moment. Flashbacks to Flash. <laughs> That's a good way to end. Listen, Nando, thanks so much. We are just about out of time. Um, but listen, uh, folks out there, go follow Nando on LinkedIn. He's got an awesome LinkedIn newsletter. Um, follow Art in Clay for his latest adventures in Clay um, and adventures on mid-journey as well. I know you're, uh, you're still posting those images from time to time, and they're really awesome to see. So... Thanks, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Um, that was the penultimate session of BYOB. Join us in 15 minutes for the last one with Damien Carroll from Figma. Thank you, Dave.